Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to the Forsyth Hall for this all age worship. And welcome to Patricia again for coming along and leading us in our worship this morning. I know I'm blotting it out, but you'll see plenty of that in a wee while. Uh, one or two announcements. First of all, uh, I think you'll have noticed a sign at the bottom of the road here, just as you turn around the corner at the Victoria Garage, and it says that as from a week tomorrow, the road will be closed. And some people were asking me last week, oh, how on earth do we get to the church? <laughs> Dinna worry. It's nay closed for the bit up to the halls and the church. So you will not be denied access to the church at the halls. It's from beyond here that it's closed. So that if you want to come to the halls or the church from west, then you'll have to find a circuitous route to get here. Next Saturday we will have the men's breakfast and that's very uh, conveniently following on from the ladies' afternoon tea this last week, which I led to believe was very successful. So, men, if you want to have breakfast at half past nine in the cock and bull next Saturday, you can let me know this week. And finally, <clears throat> thanks to all those who played a part in the, the quiz night that we had for raising funds for Christian aid this last Friday. It was a very, very successful evening with uh, many people turning up and teams present first time, so it was really very good. Congratulations to the McKeown family who happened to be the winning team. <laughs> I will now hand you over to Patricia. Good morning. Good morning. And it's me again, and it's me for the last time for a little while, uh, but thank you very much for putting up with me for all of these weeks, a uh, couple of weeks a month. I need a bit of a rest now, but quite a lot of things on in June anyway. It's nice to be here and a bit scary to do in my first all-age service on my last Sunday with you, but I'm sure we'll be fine. Uh, we've got a call to worship and a little bit for you to respond. Uh, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if I can see it in this dark night and my small writing, here we go. Jesus is seen in earthly form no more. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The risen Christ is ascended into heaven. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yet he has promised his Spirit will be with us on earth. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let us rejoice and praise him, for he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now and forever, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we're going to sing our first hymn, a well-known one, number 470, Jesus Shall Reign.
Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who made all that we see, who made all that we can see, and whose love holds it all together. We worship you. God of glory and love and power and possibility, we celebrate with you the work of Jesus, his humility and care, his love for the truth, his commitment to your plan up to and through and beyond his death, his achievement of reconciling the world to you. We celebrate his homecoming with you and with all the angels of heaven. We bend our knees in awe and we lift up our hearts and our hands in worship. Please help us when we try to talk about you, when we try to explain what we don't fully grasp. Please help us when we struggle to say what you mean to us when words can't describe our experience of you. And please help us each to remember that the person we are is more important than what we say. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who told us and showed us what you are like. <coughs> in Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Now we have some pictures and we have some bits and pieces uh, around about, as you can see. We have the first picture. <laughs> So two weeks ago, we celebrated the coronation and in my local flower shop window, I spotted something which I then asked if I could borrow and it was this. The babies really go to town in that flower shop, don't they? What is this? You know, what's the rest now? What is it? It's the... It's the... It's the... <laughs> or, thank you very much, it's the or. What does it stand for? The world, yes. You know we get the word orbit. Yeah, that comes from the same thing. So this is the orb, or to represent the orb that King Charles um, carried, uh, was donated or given to represent some of the power that he would have. And his realm, uh, his uh, kingdom, if you like, contains 15 different realms, including the UK. I've got 15 somethings around inside what we'll call the crown at the moment. Would you like to go and pull out the 15 uh, little flags from the centre of my crown for me on the cocktail sticks? Watch your fingers. Go on, go on, you're the only one. Go on, go on. Go on, it's for you today. I can give two crowns to most tables apart from one that will just have one. So. 15 and uh, always one table. So no, we'll get two, we'll get two flags for each table. Okay. And they're going to be very scared because they think now I'm going to do a geography lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a geography teacher. Um, but actually, interesting enough, I need something out of the books for you to warn you towards the camera. No, no, just need a bit of paper from inside. Are, that uh, are Christians? 
Yeah, yeah. So not the biggest number of Christians in that country, but the biggest percentage of people in that country that are Christian. Yeah. United Kingdom. It's not. You know where United Kingdom is? On this list, it's second from the bottom. <laughs> so Papua New Guinea is 95%, so that's a good guess. Yeah, and we go one up for a, an island you need to look up on your phone to see the map, because it's very tiny, to Valu. Okay, and then, okay, uh, 97%. So the UK only has 59% of people, according to the latest figures, that would claim they're Christians. And New Zealand is the bottom of these ones. 53% of people only in New Zealand would say they were Christians. Um, but all the others, apart from Belize, where's Belize? Yeah, and that bit in South America somewhere, that's right, between North and South America. All the others, almost all the others are islands, um, on the around right about the Australia Pacific kind of area, um, um, almost not Grenada, obviously, and Antigua and Bar Barbados, but all of the rest of them there are 90% and up Christians. So that's quite a challenge to us, isn't it? We call ourselves a Christian country, and we have our king who is sworn to over the Bible, yeah, that he will uh, obey God and be the, the monarch for these. Uh, kingdoms and um, these realms, and actually, we're second from the bottom as far as the number of Christians are concerned. And that's maybe why he's also had to think about, or they had to think about what's he going to do with the people of other faiths to make sure that they are included and that they belong and that they matter, um, because that's another. Do the sums? 59 from 100? 41? Is that right? 41% were either another religion or no religion at all. Okay, let's see the next slide. So, it's like the Okay, the red is current, current Commonwealth realms, and the blue are ones that were in the Commonwealth before. So if I'd asked you what country in the Commonwealth do you know, you might have said India, for instance, but it's not there anymore. Yeah? Um, um, we had very, very close links with India, with the royal family connection, of course, and with the, what did you call the person in India? The, viceroy. Yes, that's the word, thank you, I knew somebody would give me that one. The Viceroy. So it shows us, if you remember my percentage, that Christianity is actually a global faith. And it's not just for those 15 realms, okay? Uh, roughly how many people are there in the world? Roughly? So about, roughly 6 billion, give or take up. Thousands of things. And what percentage of that, not what percentage, but how many do you think of that 6 million are Christians? 2,000? No. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Right, think of a billion. Okay. Four billion. How many? How many did you say? Four billion. Four billion. Okay, not yet. But you never know, by 2050, they think there might be three billion. But at the moment, uh, and I mean not today, but roughly now, 2.6 billion of those people are Christians. So, and most of those are actually in the developing world, in the southern half of the world. So we see that Christianity is a global faith, even if we confine it to a world map or to a globe, which I didn't have at home, you know. Um, half of the people that live in, on our planet uh, call themselves Christians. So Jesus is King of Kings and Lords of Lords to all of them. I think I have another picture. Okay, right, so above 80%, of, the, of those countries are Christian, okay? Uh, the dark pink is 60 to 80 percent, the paler pink is 40 to 60 percent, and then 20 to 40 percent, uh, non applicable is white, and the very, very, very pale one uh, is below 20 percent. So that's, you can see that where Islam uh, is very strong in the north of Africa, and where uh, China, where 
There may be a lot of hidden Christian men, many hidden Christians we don't necessarily know about, it, but it, it's a uh, low percentage that we can prove as it were. So it's a global thing, and Jesus is the king to those peoples, and are with those people, whether we are here in Balhelvi, whether they're Christians I know in Cambodia, or Ethiopia, or anywhere else in the world where you have Christian connections, missionaries, or friends who are serving abroad, Jesus is with them. So he's much even more than the king of those realms, spiritual king. But actually, if we think of my crown now as a globe, that globe has holes in it because today, or Thursday, was Ascension Day when Jesus left the earth. But he's still here with us as well. So the holes in the crown, I just thought this the other day, you know, Jesus is out there, but Jesus is here with us. And what was in the very middle of the globe that you had to carefully lay in the middle? Crown. No, in the very, very middle. Jesus. A baby Jesus. Yeah. Because on your Apostles' Creed, Um, the Apostles' Creed tells us the story of Jesus in a nutshell, especially in the middle section. And I give you words, verbs to fill in, to fill in the spaces. Uh, and you'll see that there's he descended, he came down to earth, he was born as a baby, tiny, tiny baby, on this planet. And this week, we believe he's ascended, he's gone, and one day he will come back. So it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Very good. He saves him today. Right? On the third day. rise as we celebrate Easter and um, to ascend into heaven as we're going to hear in our readings and now at the right hand of God the Father and one day he will come back. And now we have the Bible readings. We have three short Bible readings. They're all about this same story. Well, the third one's not quite so short. But the third one, the, the three stories are all about the ascension. Matthew's version of the story Luke's version of the story, and remember that the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke also wrote the Gospel of the Book of Acts. So it's like Luke's continuing his story from the end of Luke's Gospel into Acts chapter 1. Thank you very much. The first reading is Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Second reading is Luke 24, verses 45 to 53. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. 
Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Their reading is Acts 1, verses 6 to 11. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So over coffee you have three questions um, typed there beside the version of the essential story you have. And the first one for you to think about together is what would it have been like to be present at the ascension? On the mountain according to one gospel, at Bethany according to the other. And the second one is why do you think the ascension is important in the story of Jesus, Jesus the King? It's not one you maybe often hear a, a sermon on. Um, some churches will have a special service on Ascension Day, which was, as I say, Thursday. But why is it important? If you think about the order of the, the, the story of Jesus in the Apostles' Creed, why was it important that he ascended? And then the third question is, if you think about what Jesus was telling the disciples or the apostles to do after he left them, seemingly, uh, we are those disciples or apostles today. So what is our role as we belong to his kingdom? Wherever that is, whether it's in Scotland or in the Solomon Isles or in Belize or in Canada or wherever. So have fun, uh, have a chat. I'll be looking for a little bit of feedback from the people who had the different stories. So we we'll look at the Matthew story I hear from about the Matthew story for question one and then the other two stories uh, and I'll go through the three questions and if I don't get the answers I, I thought of here or oh, God led me to, then we'll have your answers first and then I'll just add a little bit, bits and pieces afterwards. So let's have coffee and have a chat about those questions together. Now, we the discussion at the original event. There is a big book called Operation World that is going to come to your table and then you have no idea where your little islands, not so little islands, some of them, but they look at all of that, uh, are. You can, it's like A to Z. My son calls it his second Bible. He just loves it. Uh, I really recommend you get it uh, online or on CD or in book form. It gives you something about every country in the world. A little bit about the geography, the politics, the religion, and lots and lots of prayers. So, for instance, when I went to Ethiopia and Cambodia, I copied the page out of that book um, beforehand, prayed over it and used it. Uh, and it was very interesting to be able to see what I had read in that book. Um, it's done every 10 years or so, but it was by a guy, Patrick Johnson, as a helper now as well. Amazing feat, actually. But you can see a little map of where your country is and a few things about it if it's of interest to you. If it's a country you don't know, Realm you don't know. So we're going to sing a, what Alan thinks is a new song now. Uh, it is Jesus is the name we honour. He's going to play a chorus and a verse to us.
very kind of you here from the back, you won first, which is Alan rightly said in our group, that little passage in Matthew sometimes called the Great Commission. And we have something very similar in the Acts story as well. So our first, uh, Matthew and then the book and the Acts. So those who had Matthew, can you just, somebody on that table just give me a wave. Who had the Matthew story? This one, did anyone else have the Matthew story? Yes, the middle one up there, okay. Who had the Luke story? Okay, the back thing. And who had the Acts story? Okay, and two. So, the first question was, what would it have been like to be present at the Ascension? Just throw me out some words from, from any of your stories for that one. Terrifying. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Terrifying. Ah, what's happening? Yeah? Joyous. Joyous. Yeah, they seem to have gone <laughs> after it had happened, they were joyful. Before that, they obviously were pretty uncertain, so there's a real turnaround in the kind of uh, feelings about them. If you think, you know, this is just um, 40 days, because it's Thursday, and Pentecost is next week, which is 50 days, 40 days since Easter, uh, and all that, that that had. So they are full of joy. They are praising God, as we just did with that beautiful hymn, written by somebody who lived, used to live not far from here, by the way, up at Strathdorn. What else would it have been like to be present? Any other words you used to describe apart from frightening or terrifying or joyful? Amazing. Amazing, yeah. We've witnessed something absolutely amazing. And I have written in my notes here, it might have reminded them of another story, testing your biblical knowledge here, another story where they are in a mountain and Moses and Elijah appear. It's got a big long name, begins with T. Well done. I didn't. I didn't tell him. I didn't. I didn't put him in the tell him. Well done. Yes. So I think it might have given them a little bit. Well, we've been here before, or we've, we've experienced something a bit like this before. They wanted Elijah and Moses to stay. Remember, uh, here Jesus has left them, but they know there's, there's something special about the fact he's left. You got another answer for me? Sad. They might have been a bit sad because he'd left them. Yeah, and actually in my proper sermon on Ascension that I last preached, I kind of focused on that aspect of, you know, Jesus has left us, but he's still with us. Like those of us who've lost somebody dear to us, they've left us, but they're still with us in some special ways, as we remember a place or a smell or, or something to do with that person, or we find something in the house when we're tidying out. And so he was gone. So there was a sadness, but also they knew, they began to know that this was the next stage, like it is in the description we had in the Apostles' Creed, yeah? That it was the next stage of what Jesus had to do, yeah? Which will take us to the next question. So I put, yeah, transfiguration um, on the mountain, which would remind them of that. What's happening? Where's he gone? Is he coming back? He's left us, what are we to do now? Uh, those of you with the Acts story where the angel um, speaks to them, um, what, what, what did that remind you of? Another story where somebody is, uh, is thinking, being very sad, and then somebody says something. In the Acts story, they're all looking up. Humbling. Where is it? Humbling, yeah. When, Ma when uh, Mary was in the garden at the empty tomb, any of you link that up with what, what the angel said here in the Acts story? You the Acts story? Where, why are you looking for him here? No, he's, he's not here. He, he's going, but he will come back. He'll go where you, he told you to go. So it's a very big mixture of feelings they have there. Our next question was, why do you think this section is important in the story? And I've linked it with Jesus the King because of the children's stuff they were to do here and with what we had a fortnight ago. Obviously the kingdom is not about realms on earth, although Jesus is here. Why do you think the ascension is important in the story of Jesus the King? If it's easier to think about it this way around it might be, what if the ascension hadn't taken place? What kinds of ideas did you group have on that question? The accumulation of Jesus' work. 
Okay, yeah, accumulate a culmination or an accumulation is both really, isn't it? Because this, this is showing who he is more and um, adding to all the things that have happened before. That's what you're describing. Yes, anything else? The words, I'm mm. nice, I'm not straight. Yes, that's right, because his instructions to us, which we'll come to in question three, his instructions to us or to the disciples or the apostle. A disciple means a follower or a pupil. An apostle is somebody who's sent out. So they had been disciples for three years, and now they were to be apostles. As we learn, and we spoke about this, how difficult it can be, and we need to remind people, look, you are a disciple, but well, on a Sunday, but actually you're an apostle when you go out that door, yeah, and whoever you meet, you might be the only way they know or hear or think of Jesus, because they've met you as a knowing that you're a person who goes to church to worship God and believes in Jesus. That's quite a challenge, isn't it, which we'll come back to in a moment. What if the session hadn't happened? What wouldn't have happened afterwards in our Apostles' Creed uh, story? What wouldn't have been necessary or what, what couldn't really have happened very easily, it seems, if he hadn't ascended? The Pentecost. Pentecost, right. Okay. Which is next Sunday for somebody else to preach about. Um, but yeah, so Jesus had to leave them in bodily presence in order that he could come uh, and the Trinity is a Sunday after, and I'm glad I'm not doing that. <laughs> but um, the Holy Spirit, God, being able to be in all these places we mentioned at the beginning, already we are in the world, outside of the world, beyond creation, uh, but with Christians wherever they are, especially those who are persecuted and suffering. So if Jesus hadn't gone away in bodily form, we wouldn't have had Jesus and God back in the spiritual form. Yeah. That's good. And there's one other thing we are promised, if he hadn't ascended, it's probably, if you think of the logic of it, couldn't happen. He wouldn't go to prepare a place for us. Yes. And after that? It's returned. Yeah. He's got to go to come back. <laughs> okay. Um, so where he came, as that little tiny baby that's in the middle of that crown, he came to be one of us. His return will be completely different, and if he hadn't left, then he couldn't return. Yeah, okay. All right, so if he hadn't, uh, one would have called it a pivot, the ascension, you know, think of that, a pivot. Everything turns upon that, what happened before and what will happen after. Unless I go, the Spirit cannot come, which is what Alan said. But if I go, I will send him to you. And like someone said earlier, he's absent, but he's present now. His physical absence doesn't mean the end of presence. The first disciples knew that he was still with them, even if not in the same way as before. And we have two pictures here, thank you. This one, beautiful, isn't it? It's quite a new mosaic in, um, it's called St. Paul's Greek Orthodox, which is somewhere in America, but I can forget it. I was looking for a good one that showed the whole picture. It gives you the idea of the splendor of the king that he is absent, but he's present in all the world. And he has no limit in space. That's why the holes in the, in the crown to me says that. He can be everywhere at once, with his people in all those countries of the Commonwealth and more. And we have another picture as well. Not just no limit in space, but no limit in time. He was there before he came to earth as a baby. He was with God before the world began, as John chapter 1 describes to us, or Genesis chapter 1, where it says, We. You know, just that? It doesn't say I as in God, it says We. Um, Jesus was with God and Jesus has returned to God, but he is not limited now anymore in time or space. And he came down, he descended, now he's gone back. So the third question was, what is our role, like the disciples and apostles, as we belong to his kingdom? What kinds of things did you come up with there? Did you get question three? Too busy chatting. Any ideas? To spread the word. To spread the word. In word and also in action. Yeah? 
Anything else? <coughs> we were to follow in his footsteps. To walk in his to follow in his footsteps. To follow in his footsteps, right. Yeah, Jesus expects us to do what he did. Yeah, that's right. He said come up his command, go and speak to those near you and then those further. And he promised that where you are, I will be too. So we're not going alone. We're going, as in the hymn says, I'll go in the strength of the Lord, because the Holy Spirit is with us now and when we leave here. Um, and that's quite scary. I have a little poem here, if I can find it. Uh, I am my neighbor's Bible. He reads me when we meet. Today he reads me in my house, tomorrow in the street. He may a relative or friend or slight acquaintance be. He may not even know my name, yet he is reading me. So there'll be a lot of people, if you think of that 59% in, in the UK, who've never opened a Bible, don't possess one Bible. And we are what they have to read about who Jesus is and what Jesus can mean to people today, both individually and in a community. And a story which I gather um, Alan had heard of before is about, it's just an apocryphal story, about the archangel and Jesus when he returned to heaven after his death. 33 years isn't a long time, especially when you think about the importance and proportions of the task you're beginning to do. So Gabriel says to Jesus, back so soon, after 33 years. Well, I would have stayed longer, but they crucified me, Jesus replied. Oh, so they crucified me, said Gabriel. That means you failed. Not necessarily. You see, I called together a little group of disciples and they'll carry on my work. But what if they should fail, asked Gabriel. I have no other plans, Jesus answered. So we are in his plan. We are to carry on his work. Was there anything else you thought of that is our role in this kingdom? time prayer and then we have somebody to do the intercessions today which is lovely. Lord God as you leave the world Lord Jesus you continue to care for it. You've made us your witnesses so bless your church throughout the world that your disciples everywhere may be continually telling the good news by word and action. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray. Almighty God, may our prayers ascend to you just as Jesus Christ, your Son, was taken up to heaven. As we celebrate the ascension of our Lord Jesus, let it inspire in us feelings of joy and hope rather than fear and separation as we await the coming of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we pray for all the people that we encounter in our daily lives. Help us to recognize Christ in one another and give us an opportunity to brighten someone's day with a smile or a word. Loving God, we pray for all those in need, for those who are filled with guilt, who are brokenhearted, who are confused and afraid, or saddened because a relationship has broken down. <clears throat> we pray for all suffering from illness and give joyful thanks for those on the road to recovery. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for setting us in communities, for families who nurture us, for friends who love us by choice, for companions at work who share our burdens and daily tasks, for strangers who welcome us into their midst, for people different from us who call us to growing understanding, for children who lighten our moments with delight, and for the unborn who offer us hope for the future. Lord, we thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, and for the joy that the ear may hear. We pray for the well-being of all creation in this and future generations. Creator God, we pray for our troubled world, its peoples and their leaders. We pray for those caught up in war, violence and hatred, and those suffering due to extreme weather caused by climate change. Dear God, 
Our world will be hurting and broken. We pray for those in positions of authority and leadership, for wisdom in their decision making amidst the tense situations in Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and other places such as Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan, where conflict drains the lives of innocent victims. We pray for wisdom and compassion at the G7 talks and the Arab League summit as the world's major powers make decisions for the future. We pray for Paul and his family, for our Kirk session, and for all those who give of their time and talents to further the work of the church. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. Please comfort them in their grief and loss. Cover them with your peace and presence, as only your spirit can do. We pray for those in pain, both physical and mental. We know that in whatever we face, you are our peace and refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. Thank you for reminding us with your word. We do not face the storm alone, but you are always with us. Whispering calm, speaking peace, bringing rest to our souls. Faithful God, as we go out into the coming week, make us mindful that we should pray for your world and your people, just as Jesus, your son, prayed for his disciples before returning to you. For these and all your blessings, we give you thanks. Eternal loving God, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <coughs>
God, a vision of your kingdom, a glimpse of your glory, an openness to your rule, and your spirit to guide us. Hear us, we pray through Christ the risen and ascended one, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and all those whom we love, now and forever. Mm -hmm. 